Hello and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, and today our guest is the celebrated poet Paul Muldoon. Paul Muldoon has been called the most significant English language poet since the Second World War. He's won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, Canada's Griffin Prize, and Britain's T.S. Eliot Prize, among other awards. He was born in Northern Ireland and was formerly a professor at Oxford University. He now lives in the United States, where he is Howard G.B. Clark Professor of Humanities at Princeton University. Paul Muldoon, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. Um, there is a powerful Irish literary tradition that includes James Joyce, W.B. Yeats, and Seamus Heaney, um, who was your mentor, I believe, at Queen's University Belfast. Um, this is an illustrious tradition. And I wonder if you don't mind telling us how you would position yourself <laughs> <laughs> with well, respect to it. Well, I don't think I'd be the person who would be involved in p positioning. The, well, in I know the, it's an embarrassing question, that. but it's rather yeah. a tall order. I, I mean, it would be fantastic. It mm. would be fantastic to have even a minor role, a walk-on part, a spear-carrying <laughs> par part on that great uh, stage. Uh, but you've been assigned a part, though. You've been called the greatest poet um, in the English language, no, no less, um, since the Second World War. Well, that's War. rather a tall order, yeah. too. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, these, these are, uh, I suppose, what would one say, journalistic uh, conveniences, I suppose. Okay. And, and like so many of them, they tend to be overstatements, if not indeed uh, s slightly beside the point. Uh -huh. I'm sure that uh, the person who said that wasn't... Uh, fabricating something that was someone's opinion at a particular moment and the thing about opinions particularly literary opinions is of course they change quite dramatically and the person who's in today is uh, almost certainly out tomorrow <laughs> and reputations come and go yeah and i think particularly as one gets over uh, gets older and over <laughs> over the hill um you know one realizes i think that uh, Obviously, it's lovely if people do uh, profess to like one's poems, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not so much about reputation. Um, it's about attempting to do the thing as best one can, and uh, I suppose hoping against hope that one of these days, one of them might turn out to be mm. better, better than usual. <coughs> and I think it's that um, hope that keeps most writers going, the hope that one day they'll do it. Have you done it yet? I suppose, well, one of the great problems, of course, is that at the time, at the time, one feels one has done it. Uh -huh. Because everything looks rather brilliant uh, at the time. Maybe half an hour later, yeah. 24 hours later, a week later, or almost certainly a month later, yeah. it may not look so great. But I suppose some of them uh, I guess, have, uh, what would one say, I don't want to say have stood the test of time, but I suppose there's some of them that seem to have a few, uh, a few more uh, hours or days or weeks oh. in them. Okay. One of the things about that I have to say is that I think we all have that experience of, um, of having written something, having written a letter, a paper perhaps, um, a postcard indeed, and coming upon it, uh, perhaps months or indeed years later, and mm -hmm. reading it, and not recognizing that it was in fact written by, or as I prefer to think about it, through mm. uh, that person. You think, did I write that? And it's it's a disorienting feeling. It, it yeah. is, and at some level, it, the, 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 it's troubling, but it's also rather, uh, it's also rather releasing in mm -hmm. a way, because uh, it, uh, the minute one begins to uh, uh, believe, as I do, that these things are written through one rather than by one, um, that one doesn't quite write it oneself, mm. uh, that one gives oneself over 
to what it wants to do. And of course, when one does that, uh, there's a t terrific sense of, uh, of release and relief that mm. comes with it. The sense that one didn't quite write it brought to the present moment uh, and an allowing, if it's possible at all, it to write itself. Of course, it's not quite as so simple that, as that. So that is a rather mystical view. You do little revision, don't you, as a poet? Oh, I don't know uh, if that's true of your other writing, but that would seem to fit with this notion of being... Uh, channeling the poetry. Well, I do a <coughs> lot of revision, but I do it as I go along. Uh -huh. I do it from line to line. In other words, I tend not to write drafts, though many people, of course, do, yeah. and very effectively. <coughs> I myself don't. What I try to do is to write each line and get it right insofar as one can, insofar as one might be sure that one has. How can you do that? Do you see the whole poem no. somehow in your imagination? No. Then how do you get the line right if you're... It's that, well, you're w that's one of the, gr the, the mysteries. I think mm. there is a mysterious aspect to this. Um, against what is one testing that line? And my own sense is, again, however um, odd it might seem to say this, is one's testing it against its own hope for itself, mm. what it might, yeah, what it might conceivably be, but you know that's true. However we write poems, yeah. however we write novels, something of that test, a similar test, yeah. must take place. How do we know it's done? How do we know it has done something that perhaps hasn't been done before? Mm. We're testing it really only against itself and its own possibility because there's never quite been anything like it, right. ideally. Yeah. So that's one of the very mysterious um, and uh, I mean, terrifying in one sense, mm. but exciting in the other uh, aspects of, of all of this. So line by line, I write them. That doesn't mean they always stay, or the line that I wrote 20, 30 minutes ago or two days ago necessarily stays. But I do try to get it right at the time hmm. on the very do basic principle that one thing leads to another. Do you write your prose the same way? I do. Okay, so I it's a general method of yours. That's right. And your librettos as well? Yes, okay. everything is written a line, at, a line at a time. Mm -hmm. And of course, that does seem strange to many people. On the other hand, if, one, if you get right down to it, um, it doesn't seem strange if one applies it to other methods of construction. For example, this fine room was written a brick at a time from the bottom up, mm. you know? And some work may have done, been done on it over the years. Mm. But it's much more difficult, as I see it, mm. to go back and apply oneself to something in that corner over there, particularly the further down the wall Well, that's wall really is. interesting. So the mental construction for you is really like a physical construction. It is a physical yeah. construction. Mm. It is a physical construction. Yeah. I'm often, uh, to the dismay, I'm sure, of my students, I remind them again and again of the etymology of the word poem, mm. which is simply something that is made in the world, a construct in the world, a piece of architecture, a piece of engineering, mm. something uh, that uh, has to be built, I think, to withstand various pressures. Oh, I, lo I love that so way even, of putting it. Even to think of it in terms of physics, yeah. uh, I find quite revelatory. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, one might also think of it in terms of chemistry, you know? Reactions uh, of words with each other. Yes, yeah. these are simply metaphors by which one might begin to find a, a way Okay. into discussing it. It's not neither of those two, for example, is the end of the story. Not even the combination of them is the end of the story. But they're help, they're useful, mm -hmm. I think, as ways of... And then you discard them and come to something else. That's right, I that's right. I wonder if we could leave the abstract for a moment Absolutely. behind, because I know our audience is interested also in the concrete, and go to your actual verse. And particularly the volume that won the Pulitzer Prize, Moist Sand and Gravel. Yes. Um, there's a poem in there that I think I would like you to read, The Loaf. I chose it because it struck me as both representative of the poems and also uniquely, well not uniquely, but particularly accessible. Um, and I, I wonder if you'd read it and maybe then talk a bit about it? Yes, of um, course. So, The Loaf. Okay. When I put my finger to the hole, 
they've cut for a dimmer switch in a wall of plaster stiffened with horsehair. It seems I've scratched a 200-year-old itch with a pink and a pink and a pinky pink. When I put my ear to the hole, I'm suddenly aware of spades and shovels turning up the game, all the way from Raritan to the Delaware, with a clink and a clink and a clinky click. When I put my nose to the hole, I smell the floodplain off the canal after a hurricane and the spots of green grass where thousands of Irish have lain with a stink and a stink and a stinky stick. When I put my eye to the hole, I see one holding horse down to the rain in the hope, indeed, indeed, of washing out a few whole ears of grain with a wink and a wink and a winky wick. And when I do at last succeed in putting my mouth to the horsehair fringed niche, I can taste the small loaf of bread he baked from that whole seed with a link and a link and a linky lick. It's a wonderful poem. Well, thank you. I mean, first of all, I guess you move through the senses. Yes. It's amusing. Yes. It's gritty. Yes. It's, could you tell us a little bit about the actual historical background, content of the poem? The content of the poem, well, there are various things happening. First of all, we live in a house along the banks of, or a bank of the Delaware and Raritan Canal, uh, the great New Jersey Canal, which was built in the 1830s uh -huh. by Irish men, predominantly, um, dug by them pretty much with their bare hands and feet. Um, so and many of them, of course, dying in the process of, of digging it. Some of them from cholera. Huh. It was a cholera, a huge cholera a pandemic uh, in the 1830s. <coughs> but many of them just from the severity of the work, dreadful work. So I always have a sense of their being not too far from me, just over to one side. Because you live in Princeton, we should clarify that right now. I live now. in Princeton, yeah. a bit outside Princeton, and just the sense, the sense of these Irish navvies, which by the way is what my father was. He was a navvy. It's short, shorthand, shortened version of the term navigational um, uh, engineer. Okay. In other words, a highfalutin digger a digging man, uh -huh. a man with a spend. So that's what he was for much of his life. So I really feel quite connected to these, these, these guys. Now, the other thing is, of course, the house was built in, uh, part of it was built before the Irish come down the road in the, in the 1700s. And in that era, and for a bit after it indeed, horse hair was used as a binding uh, device uh -huh. uh, in, when one was making a plaster, cement, it was bound with horsehair. So f from time to time, of course, we do little home improvements. I mean, we can't leave it alone, needless yeah. to say. So the odd hole is drilled in a wall. And when one does that, of course, you can still see the little, um, nick, the little flecks or uh, the horse, the yeah. bits of horsehair lurking around. So that's what got me started, just the note, uh, the idea of the senses, uh, uh, as you said, a series of sensations, which of course is at the basis of our, our uh, so much poetry, mm -hmm. coming to terms with the world. Um, and uh, you then uh, th there's this refrain which occurs in it, which really only developed as, as the poem got written. Um, it wanted to be in there. Again, it seems like a strange thing to say, but this strange refrain that is on the borderline, as so many refrains are, between sense and nonsense. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the great uh, tradition of Irish poetry earlier on. One of the great refrainers, as it were, uh, was of course W.B. Yeats, who was very interested in the popular song tradition, the ballad tradition, 